Good morning. A beautiful morning. Glad to be here with you all. Uh, it's an encouragement to me to see so many faces. It reminds me that we are not alone. That we believe in something that's real. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to give you a preview uh, about uh, tonight. We've been talking about strange and unusual Bible passages, and tonight we're going to talk about a floating axe head. So if you're interested in that, the miracle of the floating iron axe, uh, I would encourage you to come tonight and hear all about that because it is about our personal relationship with God and with Jesus Christ. So I hope you can come and hear that. This morning, we're going to talk about rising from the ashes. And we're going to primarily be dealing with Mark uh, chapter 8, 34 through 38. If you want to hold that in your Bibles, uh, you can do that. It will be up there as well for a lot of the time uh, when, we, when we get to it. Um, but basically what we're going to be talking about is about our relationship with Jesus, our becoming a disciple of Jesus. And in a way, it's paradoxical, right? It, it almost doesn't make sense on the face of it, but when we really think about it, it, it makes its truth and its reason. Uh, it sounds impossible, but, when, but the gospel of Jesus Christ is salvation and eternal life, right? That's part of it. But it also calls on us to die, right? So we talk about eternal life, living forever, and we also talk about death. And in other words, in order to truly live, you have to die, right? Um, and early Christians, and that's why the, the phoenix is up there uh, in the background, early Christians, many of whom were Greek, they looked to familiar things around them to illustrate their, their new faith, right? They wanted to have symbolism of their faith. And many of them favored this mythical beast called the phoenix. Now, to be fair... They did not think it was a mythical beast back in the uh, time of Jesus. They thought this was a real bird, uh, you know, somewhere. Just people did not see it, but there was lots of stories about it. You know how we tell stories about Bigfoot and that kind of thing? Well, the phoenix for them was like their Bigfoot or one of those things. But the phoenix was a legendary bird that repeatedly overcame death. Every time it would come to the end of its, its life, it would catch on fire and it would burn away and then from those ashes it would be born again. And it was known to only reproduce or only come back through fire itself. Right? So it would burn, turn to ashes, and then it would come back to the, come back like apartheogenesis. Right? That is... Um, through only one parent or through only one, uh, one thing to become something new. And many Christians in the early church, they adorned their homes and their graves with images of this bird to illustrate their own rebirth and their own resurrection, their own new life in Jesus Christ. Burning and being come forth new, a new creation, right? And other, other early Christians also even looked at the phoenix as a symbol for um, the virgin birth of Jesus himself, right? Because Joseph was his worldly father, but he didn't contribute uh, biologically, right? And so, in a way, they kind of drew some, some, some parallel lines there, right? But this morning, this morning I want to talk about our own parthogenesis, or our own renewal and rebirth. And we're going to explore what it means to be born again. We're going to look at how a Christian is born from their ashes, those ashes of darkness and of sins and of regrets. And we're transformed. We're transformed by the power of God through Jesus Christ to a truer and more righteous purpose. Uh, and that's something that everybody has to go through in order to become a disciple of Christ. That's what we must do find everlasting life through Jesus Christ, and to die to self, to be born again. So let's, let's take a look at our, um, our text, which is Mark 8, 34 through 38. 
It says, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and he said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. You know, the first thing that I want to bring out about this text is about loss. About the loss of things. About the loss of self. The death of the old self. The death of of the old self and what that means. It means to deny ourselves. And when we deny ourselves, we are starving our sins. You know, our sins, are, our darkness is always wanting to, to flourish and to grow. But when we deny it, when we cast light, when we burn it away with the light and we starve it, it withers and it goes away. It it, it empties itself. It, it gets destroyed. Jesus tells us that denying ourselves or denying that darkness is like losing your life. Because feeding that darkness prior to that point in time, uh, feeding that darkness is, is our life's work. Right? If you're, in the, if, if you're in the world and you're not a Christian, then you're constantly trying to feed that darkness. That is the purpose and the goal of your life is to feed those dark and wicked things that entangle us and ensnare us. It is to feed that darkness. And what Jesus says is to cast light on it, to kill it, to starve it, to drive it away, to make it die, to deny yourself those evil desires. He's not talking about killing ourselves in a, in a literal sense. He's not talking about jumping off a bridge or a cliff or drinking poison or something like that. He's talking about relinquishing every thought, action, and desire. Relinquishing it and lifting it up and giving it to God to cast it away. To place our whole sinful and evil and broken nature, every mistake, every wrongdoing, every shortcoming, He's saying to put that on the altar of sacrifice and to leave it there to die. That means that anything, anything that does not align with God, that does not synergize with God's will for us and His direction for our life must be set aside. That's what Jesus is talking about when He says to deny oneself. That means selfish ambition, sexual immorality, greed, malice, Malicious intent, wrath, those have to give way. Those have to go away and give way to the goodness of Jesus Christ. Instead of envying what our neighbors have, we should give of ourselves and, and try to help our neighbor, love our neighbor as ourselves. Instead of arrogance and pride, we have to give away to humility. Instead of hatred, instead of vengeance, instead of anger, we must invite love to abide. We have to let go of those dark things. We have to be born again into this new life. We have to leave behind the things of the flesh, the things that are sinful, and go to the things that are spiritual. And it doesn't stop there. Because you can't just do that, right? How many people are like, I don't sin anymore. I don't have a problem. I'm good. Everything's good in my life. No brokenness. No, no faults. Everything's just perfect and hunky-dory. It doesn't work that way, does it? It's a process. It takes time. And sin and evil, those things do not give up willingly, do they? They don't, they don't just say, you know what? You know what, Nate? I give up. You win. It's fine. You know, I'm just going to go crawl into my little ash heap over here and I'll never come back. Being a disciple means that we have to sometimes endure the hardships of those things coming back into our lives as temptations. Sometimes it means we have to endure hardships, meaning that those things come back into our lives through our friends and through our family, through other people that we know and our acquaintances, because they don't think the same way that we do. They don't value the same things that we value. 
And then when they look at us, they are confused by the way that we're acting. And I think it will very often times be challenging for us. You know, <laughs> when, uh, when Andrew was learning to walk, uh, he really wanted to walk bad. And if he's got his mind focused on something, he's going to do it no matter what. And he had some, some trouble at first. And they were worried he wasn't going to make the benchmarks in time. You know, they, you go to physical therapy and they're like, I don't know if, you know, he seems like he's going to be delayed. And then at the last moment, right when they were thinking, well, you know, we should put this code in and say that he can't do it or whatever, they would, they would change that because he would do it. And he would fall down over and over again, but he would get up again and again. And I was worried about him because he kept falling on his face like over and over again. But he would never give up. He would not give up because he wanted to walk. He'd just keep getting right back up again. And that same determination and that same desire is what we need in our hearts to overcome sin. That even though we keep falling down and smashing our face on the ground, that we just get right back up again. And we dust ourselves off and we say, today I'm going to walk. Today I'm going to walk in the Lord. You know, and, and, and people might be against us. People might trip us up. They might stick their foot out there and tap us on the back, right? <laughs> Send you flying. And even people that we consider to be our friends might do that. But it's not about them, is it? It's not about them. They didn't make you sin. You make yourself sin. So, you have to get up again. Dust yourself off and keep on walking and say, today is a new day. And I'm going to live it for the Lord. I'm going to live it for Jesus. You know, sometimes God's ways will run counter to the advice of our friends and the world and our culture. God's wisdom is often, it doesn't align with those things, does it? And sometimes we're going to have to suffer because of that. Sometimes we're going to have to go through some hard times because of what we believe. But Jesus said that's just all part of it, right? Take a look at uh, John 15, 17 through 25. This is Jesus talking to his disciples right before he was about to die, right before he was about to go on the cross. And he's getting them ready for the life that they're going to lead after he's gone, even though he never really truly leaves. But he's telling them they're going to have to be prepared. And he says this, he says, this I command you that you love one another. Don't you love how it starts out like that? That's the foundation of everything is love. Foundation of everything that we do is love. That's the beginning and the end of everything. It's all about loving people, loving each other, treating others as better than ourselves. That's where it begins. And then he says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, because I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken with them, they would, have, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sin. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without cause. And he's saying if they hated me without cause, they're going to hate you without cause too sometimes. And that's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to stay with Jesus as we have to stay the course in our life. They hated me without cause. Being a Christian and having Christian values and having Christian beliefs means that people 
They're not going to like you sometimes. You can't please everyone. And it's going to be hard because, you know, we have an inclination that we want to not rock the boat. We don't want to get persecuted. We don't want to get picked on. We don't want to get seen as different. We just kind of want to blend in. You know, someone, we don't like conflict sometimes. But sometimes it comes anyway. Becoming a Christian means we have to reject the ways of the world. It is to view worldliness as a sin. And the world stands in opposition to God. And humanity in large part, they fight against what is righteous and what is good and what is godly. And you can see that in the world, right? You just look, you turn on the news, and no matter where you are, no matter what you see, and you look at your phone, you see things that are against God. You see lots of sad things happening in this world. Lots of evil. And people, when they see the light, a lot of times they want to destroy that light because people don't understand it. The world, people try to destroy what they don't understand. John 1.5 says, And the light shineth in the darkness, and darkness has not comprehended comprehended it. So we're talking about denying ourselves. We're talking about being the light. We're talking about transformation. We're talking about change. To reject our desires, to reject the inclinations towards sin, to look for divine guidance and wisdom, even when the world tells us that it hates us and it's going to punish us if we do the right things. And that we have to withstand criticism and hostility of those who remain committed to the darkness. Because people destroy what they don't understand. They hate what they don't get and don't understand. They can't even think like you. It's not possible for them to think that way. Being a Christian is a call to have faith in God's purpose for us. It's a call to take courage and to be brave in the face of mockery and of persecution. Those are all really hard things to do. But why? Why go through all that? <laughs> right? You're saying, man, you're really making Christianity sound super attractive by all of this stuff that you're saying about denying yourself and standing against sin, about standing up for what's right even when the world tells you that they're going to punish you for doing that, for doing the right thing. Well, there's a good reason why. There's a lot of good reasons why we do that. And you know, that's the other half of what Jesus is saying, isn't it? Why we should do these things. There is a reason to have this faith and there is a reason to be brave. There's a reason for our sacrifices. It leads down to this resurrection, this new life. He says, for whoever wishes to save his life, whoever wishes to be preserved, that person will lose it. That person will give it away if you want to save your life. But whoever loses his life for my sake, whoever loses his life for my sake, and the Gospels will save it. And that's the paradox. That's the paradox. That is the phoenix rising from the darkness. That is the rebirth, the renewal, the life that God offers to everyone. And that is the sacrifice that is worth everything. It is eternal life. It is eternal life in heaven with God. You know, I, I like the, uh, the parable of the, the pearl here in Matthew 13, 45 through 46 about the kingdom of heaven. It says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value who went and sold all that he had and bought it. He gave up everything in his life. All the things that he had to have this one pearl. And that's the kingdom of heaven. That is God's kingdom. And, that, and, and our faith, our Christianity, our belief in God, our dedication to Jesus Christ and His teachings, that is that pearl. That is that eternal life. The kingdom of God is everlasting life. It is eternal joy. It is no more guilt and no more crying, no sadness, 
no temptation to do evil and wicked things where the light always shines in darkness is nowhere to be found. It is all that is good and light and right in the world and far beyond, beyond even our greatest and grandest imaginations. That is the kingdom of heaven. This is what fills a Christian's hopes and dreams is looking forward to that and changing our lives in accordance with that desire to be with God in heaven for forever. And that's our reality. And that's why we choose to be born again. Furthermore, as wonderful and awesome as heaven is, becoming a disciple of Jesus is not just about our future hope and the things that we have to look forward to, although that is a huge part of it. Everlasting life. But you know, our relationship with God, it affects us in a positive way even today in this very moment. Through that sacrifice of self, we can come into a communion and a relationship with the Almighty God. We can know and understand Him better. We can feel Him with us right now. We're in His holy temple and He is filling this holy temple at this very moment. His mighty angels looking down on us. We're gathered here together in this place. The temple of the living God. His power is flowing through this place and we are on holy ground. We are in His presence at this very moment. And that's an awesome thing to think about and to contemplate, isn't it? All of the petty things that we think about, all of the disagreements and the arguments They're burned by the light of God's power and His justice, His righteousness. All those things just are meaningless and petty and small. We're here doing something awesome. We are here worshiping God together and thinking about Him. And in addition to being in communion and the presence of God, we're also receiving a new life, a new and fresh start, a new lease on life. A restoration. A restoration that leads us down a path of a truer and nobler purpose. You know, when you do the right thing, doing, you know how you say, do, they say doing the right thing is its own reward? That's because it is. When you help somebody and you know that you made a difference, when you do something good, when you know that you're following Jesus and you know that you're doing the right things in your life, don't you feel good about that? Doesn't it just feel right? There's a reason for that. Because that's how you were meant to be. That is the the person that God created you to be is to fulfill that good and noble and true purpose in your life. And the reason why you feel good is because you're filling that purpose. And we know it deep down. We know it deep down in the core of our soul that what this is what we were meant to do. This is what we were meant for. This is why we're here. And this is a glimmer of heaven on earth, the church. It is a reflection of the wonder and the awesomeness of God. And we feel that when we live according to His purpose, when we do what we're supposed to do, when we live the way that we're supposed to live, when we love each other, when we forgive each other, when we have compassion and gentleness, when we live in the way of the Spirit, we feel that. And it's its own reward. It is a greater reward than anything that money can really put a price on because it lights the path to the kingdom of God. It lights the path to heaven. And we just know that it's better. And all of these things, the kingdom of heaven, the closer relationship with God, the better and nobler and truer purpose for life, all those things are why we die to our old selves. Those are compelling and powerful reasons. And so when we're tempted to do the wrong thing, when we're tempted to sin, we need to remember the good things. We need to remember God and His Holy Word and His example for us and all that He does in our lives. We need to remember what it is that we're really here for. And no matter what arguments that we get into, we've got to let that go and let that aside. Because we're here for a truer and nobler purpose. That's the salvation of our souls. 
and for all those who will hear the Gospel. Jesus calls each of us into this paradox of discipleship. We have to lose our lives in order to find it. We have to let go of our sin and the lust of the world, and we have to give those things up to die. We have to leave them in the ashes and follow Christ in His love, His grace, and His godly wisdom. And through that, and through all the temptations that we face, through all the harassments, through all the persecutions, we must stand courageous and brave and remember remember our true purpose. To fight against these schemes and onslaughts of the devil. To be brave. Stand up for Jesus. Because it's worth it. Because we receive a relationship with our Creator, a new, fulfilling, and truer purpose, and a place in the kingdom of our Almighty God. So I invite you to consider this day whether you will pick up the cross and follow Jesus, and whether you will let, like the furnace, Phoenix, burn those sins away and leave them in the dust and be born a new creation in Jesus Christ, be born again into His light. And you can make that commitment today. You can take the first steps into the family of God if you believe in Him and His power to save you. If you're willing to change your mind and your heart and repent. If you're willing to be baptized in commitment to Him. And you can receive the forgiveness of your sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. That promise is for you if you want to come forward this morning. I encourage you to do so. As we sing our closing song, I'll fly away like the phoenix.